Thanks to Isaiah chapter 6. I would, uh, I'm going to be out over the next two weeks. And so I would encourage you, unless the Holy Spirit speaks a specific word to you, to continue in the Psalm 19 study. But we have some uh, unique things going on right now that I uh, feel like need to be covered and covered well. And uh, here's what the Holy Spirit, what I feel like the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. In fact, this is something that spoke to me just during worship this morning. I was going to go a little different direction. I probably would have flew the other direction, but this is what he said to me right now. Isaiah 6, verse 1. Everybody got your Bible right? The one rule in chapel is you got to have a Bible. You got to be following along in the Bible. Need another one? There's another one right here. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. Keep that one if you want. What was it again? Isaiah 6, verse 1. It was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They called out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the, Lord's, the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. And then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed, for I'm a sinful man. Filthy lips. I live among people with filthy lips. But I've seen the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongues. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Yes. Go and say to this people, Listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people, plug their ears, and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts, and turn to me for healing. And I said, Lord, how long will this go on? He said, until the towns are empty and their houses are deserted and the whole country is a wasteland, until the Lord has sent everyone away and the entire land of Israel lies deserted. Stop right there. Now, there's a, there's a headline to this passage that is extremely important as we get into this exact next phase at Freedom Valley. And the headline is chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Uh, whenever we go through changes as a church, especially as a staff team, the changes create a, a place where it's really hard to keep your eyes on God. Because things are happening that, make, that rearrange everything. This morning I want to pray over our three new staff members that uh, have replaced last week. We prayed over Josh and Charity and blessed them in leaving. Uh, they are at Valley Forge this morning, plugging in, and uh, I'm excited for them, excited for the legacy that they left behind and uh, all of that, but I'm way more excited about the future because this is, this is ours. And my God loves to bless and he blesses well. He has great intentions for this church, with or without me, with or without us. He has great intentions for this church, that, the task for us is to figure out whether we're going to be part of that. And uh, so when, when it says of Isaiah, in the year of the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, you got to understand that King Uzziah, I forget how long he reigned, but I'm thinking it was like 52 years. Like, can you imagine a president? 52 years in Washington, and the same thing. The same policies, the same procedures, the same style. This was an incredibly good time. When King Uzziah died, uh, was one of the wealthiest times in Israel's history, a time of extreme prosperity and blessing. It was good. But when he died, every time there's a change of leadership somewhere, the change in pecking order makes it very hard to keep your eyes on God. 
because there's so much going around, it's easy to stop looking this way and start looking around at the people around you. It's easy to get critical. It's more easier than ever to get. It's always easy to get critical. But especially at the time of change, it's easy to focus on what's not so great. Uh, it's easy to uh, be thinking about me. Where do I fit? How does this work? How good am I going to look in this? And while somebody else is getting promoted, did I get promoted enough? All that kind of stuff. And uh, it was in that year that Isaiah made a decision to see the Lord. He uh, spent time with God that right in the middle of that tumultuous time of change, more than ever, he went in with God. And right there, God spoke to him. Right there, God met him. And how God met him is important. It goes, it's easy to get into these details. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. And attending him were these mighty seraphim with six whims, wings. And, uh, and, and there's this, these voices in heaven. And then all of a sudden, when you focus on God, God focuses on you. And he heard these voices in heaven. Verse, go all the way down to verse 8. You, you got this whole picture set for you. <coughs> Then I heard, so Isaiah is uh, suddenly in the midst of this new environment. He's, here, he's seeing this incredible heaven. And he's seeing there's so much going on. And look how he, he says it in verse 8. Then I heard the Lord asking, Who can I send as a messenger to this people and who will go for us? The tone here isn't, uh, as I understand, uh, the Bible scholars talk about it a little more intelligently than I can. The, the tone here is not like God said this once, but that God is always saying it. Then I heard that the Lord is asking. Might be a way to, to look at that, if I'm understanding it correctly. And he's always asking this question. Who can I send? Who's ready? Who is available today? I was thinking of, um, of Paul's words when he writes the the uh, little letter uh, to Philemon about Onesimus. And he says, Onesimus is useful to me. Those are incredible words. Paul is saying, Onesimus made himself useful, and God picked him out for that reason. And I need you, Philemon, to be thinking about that when you think about what happened between the two of you. There was a relationship situation. I don't want to muddy the waters with that. I want to focus on that what the Holy Spirit used Paul to say was that he is useful to me. Really key. Now what I want to talk about today in, in the next couple of minutes, and then I want to pray over our new staff members and bless them, encourage them, uh, is uh, some, some values that uh, the Holy Spirit gave us here uh, over the years for uh, choosing staff. I'm going to use the board here. Jason, if you need to adjust the camera for that. Um, I want to use the board to get these down. So, staffing values. Uh, everybody on our teams here, and by staff I do not mean paid staff, I mean anybody who has a dedicated position of serving somewhere in the church. Everybody in our teams here, the first value is that they are relational first. And of course, what is the key relationship? Relationship with God. <clears throat> you know, Jesus said, if you have a relationship with God, then if you spend time with God secretly, everybody knows. It is a foregone conclusion. People can feel it on you. If you don't, everybody else knows that. Whatever you do spend time with can be felt. It oozes through your pores. It comes out of your spirit. It connects with people. And so, uh, first thing I want with... Uh, with people that I see God promoting is that they, first of all, they have a real relationship with God. No kidding. Um, got to make myself a note. And that it can be felt because you can't fake it. You can for a while. Yesterday, uh, we were talking about uh, as as I, I drove Josh Cherry to Valley Forge 
so I could hang out with my granddaughter for a little bit. <laughs> we stopped for lunch, and over lunch, uh, Cherry at one point mentioned some regretful things, some things she wishes she would have done better. And uh, it was really interesting to me because I don't, I don't know anybody who, uh, when, when you're looking back, doesn't have things you regret, right? Yeah. And those are important, by the way. They, they say a lot about who you are, to be able to identify them and to forsake them. And, and I thought, wow, she is nothing like that today. And I appreciate it. It was a sort of healing even to hear her admit them. That's an honest confession that's good for your soul and it's also good for the souls of the people around you. Because I didn't know she recognized those. And uh, somebody said, how did you overcome them? She said, well, spending time with God and spending time with people who spent time with God made me want to not be like that anymore. And I, I, I'm not here to confess her sin. <laughs> that's, that's her deal. So I don't want to talk about the particulars, I want to talk about the concept. That it was really cool that she was, I could feel a relationship with God that had made a big difference, especially lately. So not only a relationship with God, but you know, for, for anybody to uh, be noticed by God and to, to excel around here, they have to be good with relationships with people. You know, there's, there's a joke about pastors getting together and the pastor's fellowship. One of the pastors said, I love the ministry, I would love the ministry if it wasn't for the people hard time with people man. people were well the truth is there wouldn't be ministry if there wasn't people right. and if people didn't have problems there wouldn't be ministry like T.D. Jakes has said in the leadership thing I'm quoting a lot uh, the last couple of days that I love it so much he said they should be talking about us if they're not there's something wrong with us mm -hmm. so stop complaining that people are talking about you and thank God that you are newsworthy to them that's a, that's a great thing. So relationship first, that is a relationship with God and then a relationship with people. Secondly, passion over skill. I've said this in different ways over the years, but um, what I mean by this is if I had a skilled person who is bored with the job or a passionate person who's not that skilled yet, I would take the passionate person any day. You know why? A passionate person will develop the skill a skilled person may or may not ever develop the, the passion. So I want somebody who's passionate about their work, no matter what it is. If you're not passionate about maintenance, you're not going to be good at it. If you're not passionate about outreach, you're not, you're not going to be great at it. I should say great. You can still be good. Um, if you're not passionate about worship, you're not likely to be great at it. And so I, I will take passion over skill. If you can get both. If you can get passion and skill, you really got something. Of course, that's what we all want to achieve. And a passionate person will become a skillful person eventually. If you're passionate about something, you can maintain passion. By the way, the, the, the key to life is to find the thing you can maintain passion about. You know, um, and you should try a lot of stuff to figure out what that is. I talked to a young person lately who said, I'm interested in everything about six months. He said, in one or two cases in my life, I've been able to maintain interest for a year and a half, and I can't stand it anymore. And that's my problem. I keep starting things that are no fun anymore. Well, I was like that until I found uh, pastoral ministry. It fascinated me endlessly, and I discovered after a year and a half, I was more interested than I was before. And after two years, or three years, or five years, or 30 couple years, I'm more passionate about it than I ever was. So uh, that is the uh, another way you know your skill. I said Sunday that one of the ways you know what you are called to is the thing you can't stand in church. If you can't stand it, you're called to it. <laughs> because your, your passion about dislike in that case indicates your call to it. But the other way is what can you maintain passion about for a, for a while. So. I want to see somebody who's passionate more than I want to see somebody skilled. I want both eventually, but when it starts out, passion over skill. Uh, thirdly, past performance. Um, I like this, the phrase, and I also fear the phrase that says, past performance is the best predictor of, of uh, future performance. So, um, you know, when we evaluate church planters, there is eight skills that a church planter has to have. We actually break them into about 16, but it all comes down to 
those all come into about uh, eight. And if they don't have them, they're not likely to build them in the midst of the crush and the pressure of church planting. You have to somehow identify which ones you don't have and build them first, then get into the crush of church planting in most cases. Uh, so past performance is the best predictor of future performance. Now the scary part of this is, suppose I was lousy in the past, but God called me to something. Will people always judge me for the past? And the answer is, heck no. Here's what happens. As soon as you make the turn, people start giving you credit for having already rounded the turn. Does that make sense? As soon as, like, for example, even in higher education, uh, to be, they, they tell us here to have our props for this new school that we're starting here. You either need a master's degree or you need to be on your way to a master's degree. Both count. Does that make sense? As soon as you start on your way to a master's degree, they give you credit as if you have one. And the same thing's true of past performance. As soon as you change the performance, you're on your way. When, when Terry said yesterday about regrets, she was given credit for having changed as soon as she started changing. Not because you've already changed and have 10 years of being clean or 10 years of being different or 10 years of perfect performance. It's starting on it gets you incredible credit with God and then with other people. So past performance. Um, fourth, I want somebody who makes everybody better. There's some people that are highly skilled, but when they're on a team of when they're on a team, everybody else loses skill. Hmm. Like I can think of a person that I seriously considered hiring at one point who everything he went to, the other team members around him quit. You know why? He was a perfectionist. And, and in his quest for perfection, it would just drive other people crazy. Perfectionism, by the way, is idolatry. Hmm. It is believing that I can be so good that God will finally like me. And he says, I gave you that as a gift. Why don't you take my gift? Why are you idolatrous about your skills when it's my skills that count, God says. So um, I want somebody who makes everybody better. That is, somebody who um, will laugh at yourself so that other people can laugh with you. Somebody who uh, is constantly encouraging the people around you and they just want to step up because they, they feel the encouragement. Somebody who would promote somebody else above themselves. I'll tell you a little story about Jason Hollenbeck. He started. Jason started working in our in our youth ministry, and uh, my son Luke was working in our youth ministry. And uh, I saw that Jason was excelling in his studies, but he was also an extraordinary youth worker. And I was trying to think, God, I see two people emerging in our youth leadership, and I watched Jason promote my son over himself constantly he made Luke look good and all of a sudden the Lord unfolded why because Jason needed to go finish his studies at Valley Forge and then come back and he was an easy choice for a youth pastor because I watched him promote somebody else over himself and that's not easy to do that's hard when somebody else is excelling and you want to look good so bad and you want to you want to show that you have more heart and soul for it than they do? It is so hard not to undermine them or criticize them or put them down or uh, notice their weaknesses out loud or, or something like that. And uh, I, I developed so much respect for Jay on that. I was uh, astounded because I've hardly ever seen that. That's one of the ways that he makes, that he made other people better. And now he's a team builder. He's a team builder because he does the same thing now. He promotes other people around him, and uh, I just want to appreciate that. And many of you do that. I just felt like the Holy Spirit gave that one as an example. Um, <coughs> fifth, I want somebody who's about the cause. By that I mean somebody who's more passionate for the cause that God calls to than for the pay. A lot of people are passionate to be paid to do ministry, but people who eventually get paid are passionate for the cause, irregardless of pay. 
is I say, listen, I will work two jobs for the cause that God called this church to. And that's how I know they're not a hireling that Jesus called. He so said some people are hirelings. That is, it has to be money first for them. The first thing is, how much will I get paid? What are the benefits? How much will people like me? Is there a title? And while they don't come out and say that directly, you can feel that coming out of the spirit because that's what really matters. And if it doesn't happen, they're not going to work. They're not going to do anything. They're not going to help. But uh, that's why we always hire from within if possible. That's why we always promote somebody who's already doing the job if possible. Now, those of you who would like one of the jobs that uh, somebody has around here, listen, God regularly promotes and moves people around here. So if you want one of the jobs, if you want Tommy's job or Aaron's job or my job or Jeremiah's job or Larry's job or whoever's, start now developing passion for that job. That will promote you. And passion for the job over passion for whether or not you get paid promotes you. It gets God's attention because then, then you're not a hireling. It's not about the money. It is about the cause. It's about God, God's cause working in us. And uh, of, of one more, then I want to uh, open up for a couple of suggestions real quickly. The last one is God does it. I notice it. That is, I don't believe I have ever promoted anybody. Not successfully, anyway. I watch God promote. When God promotes, I notice it. You make, does that make sense? See, some people uh, butter, butter me up as if, if, they, if they compliment me enough, or if they love me enough, they give me enough presence that I will promote them. I don't get to promote anybody. God does. And I've noticed people that go nuts with that kind of stuff. And when they're not promoted, get bitter. Which means they really thought, I'm the promoter. I'm not. And a few times I have disobeyed God's voice and promoted somebody because I thought they were just the coolest people in the entire world because of how nice they are to me or something. This has been a miserable failure. However, when God promotes, <laughs> it doesn't matter whether I like or not. It doesn't matter whether I... Uh, had something to do with it or not. When God promotes, uh, I just get to notice it and say, here's what God is doing, so I want to go with God. I want to do what He's doing. And I, this is very hard to believe. I know people, uh, cynical people say, yeah, man, I don't know. I think it all comes down to who greases the wheels and who's got the best relationships and who... Now, I'm tempted with this too, but uh, um, we just... Uh, reveal my heart a little bit on this. When I go to a place like Springfield, like last week where I was at in Springfield, Missouri, and uh, I'm at the 100th Centennial, and I'm thinking, all these guys that have great national, international jobs, they all went to Central Bible College. They all happen to have some relationship with George Wood or somebody on the inside. And, and Satan's there tempting me, saying, you know what? That's what it takes. It takes those connections. Yeah, God uses an amazing amount of things. That's not what it takes. And I cannot allow the devil that tempts me in that way to, to push me over that to that thought for one second because it takes me off of my calling. You know what God promotes? God promotes people who do what he called them to do. They do it passionately. They, they keep doing it. They trust him to promote them in due season. They don't believe they, they get it themselves. Did I miss any? I've said these in different ways, so uh, maybe you're thinking of one that I said in a different way. Maybe you guys have been here for a while, have I miss any? Any you're wondering about? You look, any question you would have about it? Okay. Last thing I want to do is uh, I want to pray over uh, the new staff members that are getting started today and just bless them, encourage them. So that's Aaron and Tommy and Hannah. Could we uh, have you guys sit up front here? We can gather around here.